It is my privilege that we can continue our study in the book of Romans. We are remembering that we are in the judgment hall of God and there is his law that is broken and humans are separated from God and God has a solution for them to get out of this terrible situation through the power, the dynamite of his gospel. But humans get the choice through the gospel to believe and be restored and come into the benevolence of God, or they can resist this power. And when you resist a power for the good and you choose the evil, there is nothing that can come to you except a wrath, because a righteous God is hating unrighteousness and so it is the end that everyone then in the end has chosen in spite of the power that could free them from their state in which they were born. Now we remember this picture about righteousness and unrighteousness and this picture with the stove is one that uh, I came to like because it's so simple and brings such a profound truth. There is one thing where we can break the law, and that one thing is just in the unlawful connection that brings all the results with it. You see, there is one thing that Adam and Eve broke when they were created. They broke their trusts in God. They came out of that lawful connection in which they function perfectly, in which they can not break if they are in the lawful connection, in which they would have fulfilled everything why God made them. They would have lived forever and all their deeds would have been righteous. But Eve was the first one that mistrusted God and broke that connection and connected herself to the wrong source and became a reason for Adam to doubt God as well. And so they both became unlawful, connected to Lucifer. And from now on, they are changed. They don't have that what we today call free will. They are in the bondage of another one and now they don't function properly, they break, they cannot fulfill the purpose for which they were created and their life must end because a stove that is not connected to the right source cannot work. And God made us to, with great properties, with great, uh, he, he endowed humanity with with being able to do great things, to expand in spiritual things for all eternity, except they were connected. You see, an instrument like a computer can be very performant, but without the connection, he's nothing. And this is what we need to understand. We are free to do everything God gave us to do, if just there would be the lawful connection. And there is no choice for that. As the the creator of the stove has to make the stove to be connected to a power source, so when God created us, he made that our spirit should be connected to him, and from there all the power could come to the body and to the whole world. There is no choice for the connection. We are free to use everything that God gave us as we are connected. But if you're not connected, how much can you use? So so all the descendants of Adam and including us, we are connected from birth to Lucifer. But Lucifer puts before him our other dear relationships, mother, father, children, spouse, friends, or pets. And so we are not aware that through our sinful nature we connect 
to this in trust, like we would connect to God. And yes, can we have life from mother? Can we have life from father? Can we have life from our children, our spouse, our friends, our pets? Is there life there? Is there power there? Of course not. You must die. That's why sin or disease, I want to say, comes from there. We die because we trust the wrong person. Just this week I had a touching case in my practice where a woman, she's 77 years old and for two months now she hardly can walk because her right vestibular organ is affected. She is dizzy. She, she can walk, but it's a horrible thing to see how she, she cannot adjust and she has no, no balance. And so I asked her, that said, what, what's going on? Because such a heavy issue cannot come from something that is superficial. Yes, everyone gets this little bit dizziness for a week or two because they have some connections and trust to whoever they have, but not for so long. And so she says that she's in a struggle with her son. So it's so perfectly in the right side of her vestibular organ. She, she, has, a connect, she has a struggle, a fight with her son who since 2013 wants to take her own inheritance. 2013 her own mother died and she left her some inheritance, a house and other things. And now the, the oldest son says, that's my inheritance, you have to give it to me right now. And he fights with lawyers and, and, and wants to, to take that which is mother's inheritance. And she just resists to that. And she has a daughter, she is a, a famous lawyer, but the daughter won't help her because she says, I won't be a lawyer against my brother. And so she has to spend all her money on lawyers and fights. And now she says, I'm ready to die. I don't want to live anymore. I will die, she says. And she was speaking of suicidal ideas. Why? Is she aware in her heart that she's deceived, that she's bound to her children for love? for righteousness and she breaks but who breaks her is it her son who breaks her is it the daughter who breaks her doesn't help who breaks her it's that evil eye it's that 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 we are not aware that we are bounding ourselves to a source that has no power there is no righteousness in a man what and how and why do we expect righteousness from a man? Why do we expect truth that should come out of a man? Why would we expect love that come out of a man, which is there nothing in it at all? This is the evil thing, and without love, without righteousness, we cannot work. That's the power source. That's... The means, the power means, and God is the only one who is righteous, the only one who is the truth. But we are connected unconsciously through this evil eye to that which is wrong. And we are not even aware of it, even though if we want to do the good, we cannot do it. Now let's look what is the place of the connection. Because there, out of that place, all other things come out. Because if the connection is correct, all deeds are right and correct. Everything is there. And so we see here the subconscious, we see the heart, and identity is the decisive element in the heart. Because since the spirit must trust, he will trust according to what he thinks he is. And if he knows that he's a created being and that that is the truth, his trust would be only in God. 
And if his trust is only in God, he will live accordingly. But Adam mistrusted God, and so he changed the trust. And so in his inner thing, something got changed. That's the identity. He got the idea he's not now not a created being. He's not a stove anymore. He is the power source. He is there, and he does not know that he is in total blindness. And so what can he do? Let's look to the will and the heart. Because here plays the battle between the will and the heart. The will, God created us with a will that would do only the good. So what we want are only good things. But they must be proceeded through the heart where the connection is. And out of the heart does come the part of the will, what I do. So the will has many parts probably, but at least he has these two things. The one that is set and the other one that is active. And whenever I want something, that's before it goes into my heart. And what I do, that comes out of my heart. So the actions all come from the heart. The intentions go into the heart. We perceive things. We get an information. It comes into our will. Then it must It goes to the subconscious. There it is processed and decided. And then the will puts it into action. Now, if the will is connected to God, what I want, I also do. So the doing and the wanting is identical. Because God made the will, and if the heart is connected to God, we do exactly what we want to do. Because we were made to be one with God in our will. When Jesus came to the earth, he said, I did not come to do my will in the way that to say, I come because my will and the Father's will are one. In in John 17, he says, as you and I are one. Where are they one? They are one in the will, in the heart, and in the doings. They are connected. They have the same Purpose. Jesus died on the cross because he loved to do the will of his Father. He was identifying himself totally with the will of the Father to save us. So his love was taken out of the Father and saying, if the Father loves these people so much, I will love them as well. So what he wants, he does. Adam never did anything that he did not want to do until he got to mistrust God. Then something changes. Now he cannot do what he wants. I cannot do what I want. And we read this in Romans 7. And I start now from the end of the chapter going into the beginning of the chapter. Because... It, I think it's just easier to understand. So let's look to this. We read from Romans 7 from verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would that do, that for what I would that do, I not. But what I hate, that I do. Now this is a little bit difficult, the translation. For what I want to do, he says, I don't do. You see the conflict here? From the willingness to want to do the right and do the wrong. Do you think this mother wants to do wrong? Does she have any bad intentions towards her son? No. She wants righteousness. But what comes out of her heart? Bitterness. Misunderstanding. Great, great, uh, a great heavy load. But why does that come? Because she wants, she does what she wants? No. She's sold under sin. That's what is very clear here, this expression. If then 
I do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that it is good. Yes, the law says, we will see what the law says. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So this is it. Sin, that sinful nature that does, that I don't do what I want. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, and that is the flesh, and when it is written about the flesh of, this, of our spiritual thing, we will see that in next chapter, chapter 8. It's nothing else as the evil eye, as Jesus called it, or it is sinful nature. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, it's not in the whole human being, like some people understand this Bible verse. It's not the whole human being that is wrong. There's only one thing in us that is wrong. And that's this thing that binds us to the wrong connection. And if you're bound to the wrong connection, how much things must be wrong in you that you shouldn't work? It's all. So it's not that our will is wrong. It's not that we don't have abilities that were made by God. Humanity, yes, is broken through this nature but when he says for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing he does not mean his whole being he just means his sinful nature he just means this is that what makes us flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me but how to perform that which is good I find not for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would, not that I do. Now, if I do what I want, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now let's make sure that we understand the words that he speaks here. It looks like people could come and say, well, it's in the flesh, it's in, the, in my body, in my members, the evil. Paul just explains the difference between what I want and what I do. Because the members do what the heart says. And that's why he says, I, I want to do the good in my mind, but when I look to me, my members do the wrong. You see, I want to be always kind, but what comes out of me? There is something in my members. It's not in the members, it's in this sinful nature, in the flesh. But my members follow, it's that action that I do. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, is there deliverance? Yes, there is. So, then, with the mind myself, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He just wants to say, and many people don't understand that, or it's a misunderstanding. He just wants to say that in the will, we all want to do the good. But out of us, in the flesh, we serve sin. There is no other service. Now, where do you find yourself? Are you a free man? Do you choose to sin? Or not? It is such an important thing that we know that when we sin, we don't choose to sin. Does this lady, in the example, choose to not love her, husband, her, her son or her daughter? That she has so a heavy load that she doesn't understand what they do and how they are so covetous. Is she wanting to do that? There's a lady who came to me just also recently. She's an, a Christian lady and she had had a husband that left her with three little children. And now comes along another man, and she knows it's unlawful to not have an intimacy relationship with him, but in her need for love, she 
enters into an intimate relationship with him, and now she marries later, and she got pregnant, and then she loses her, her pregnancy, and she almost dies, and now she comes up with the idea that God has punished her because she did that sin to sleep before time with her boyfriend. Now she's in guilt, and her guilt destroys her. Now, is she right, or is she wrong? Does she choose to sin, or does she have no choice? Now, most people are confused, and they believe she would have a choice. You see, the Bible says it not only through Paul that we are slaves, sold under sin. That's a slavery. What slavery? You do what you want or you don't do what you want. And if you're a slave, then realize that you cannot do the good out of yourself, out of this flesh, of this blindness, of the identity I am God. Nothing good can come out even though it might look good. We think that we have a choice to not sin. We don't have a choice to not sin. The choice, we will talk last uh, next time, is only given when you see your slavery. Before you see your slavery, you have no choice. Because you would say, oh, I can, I can, I can. And you try and try and try. And what happens? You're frustrated because you think you could not go after that woman. Or you could not go after that appetite or after that lust. You have no choice. We are sold under sin. Jesus says in John 8, 34, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he who committeth sin is a slave of sin. That is, he does not do it because he wants it to do. Are you sinning because you want? Then first you must have been freed. Like Adam, you must have been here to sin by what you want. So let us Understand, this is crucial for everyone to be saved. If you believe that you sin by choice, then you have no choice. If you believe that you are a slave of sin, then you have a choice to be saved through Jesus Christ. Now, let's read a little bit more. Let's look to the role of the law. And we read here from verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, For without the law, sin was that. Was sin that without the law? No, he just didn't know it. So it's a way to say things. And I hope we understand. We will go and and look to it. For I was alive without the law once. Was he alive? No, of course, he was dead. But he did not realize that he was dead. But... For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So what does he want to say? He says, oh, I was living without knowledge of sin. And when the knowledge of sin came through the law, I saw it and then I must die. And I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. And he speaks about that death that we spoke last time. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. 
as then that which is good made death unto me, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now, let's make it simple. There is the role of the law explained here, and as we have seen in verses 14 to the end of the chapter, as he repeats one and the same idea several times, here he's doing the same. Paul is a, a man, and I see sometimes some, something that he has in common with me. He repeats all the time the same thing, and I'm doing the same. Maybe we all do the same, but... Uh, it's very obvious in him here that he's just repeating one and the same idea and puts a little bit another connotation when he gets again and again and again just to make the point. So what's the role of the law? We know that by the law there is a cause and effect. The cause is the motivation which comes out of the right connection or of any connection. So the law then... And we know that's only one law, that of cause and effect. That's the taking and the giving, and I explained it again and again. The law then is the light. If you know the light, if you know the law, you know everything. Because the law is the expression of God. Now, you cannot use the law literally and point to the actions here that the law says. And then you look to the effect of the law. Taking this lady that committed uh, and broke the law by having sexual intercourse with a man she was not married with, and she knew by the law that those works are wrong. But now that she thinketh that she has the ability not to do them, she is guilty before God. And so she tries what to do? She tries to take away the effect. She tries to fulfill the letter of the law, which is nothing else than fighting the symptoms. Fighting the effects is the most, I think so, unreasonable thing. You see, that's what we do in religion and that's what we do in medicine. We're fighting the symptoms. And what's the result? Evil is the result. Diseases come more. Humans die earlier. There has never been on the earth so much disease as today because we fight a symptom. Look to the religious people and look to those who might be the most serious ones, and look to their character, they are all violent people. They want to force the good on others. How many sincere Christians I meet, and they are so heavy led, loaded because their child is not in the faith, or he takes drugs or whatever. And they would, if they could, change they're children. And they are so pressing, fighting against the works that these people do. Will they ever have a success? If you fight the symptoms, if you think if your son just doesn't drink alcohol or he just goes to church, if you think that will save him, then you're right or wrong. I hope you realize it's wrong. It doesn't matter if one does goes to church or not as long as there is that sinful nature in it. There is no choice for life. We're fighting the symptoms. That's why we find in the Christian world not love. You don't find the love in, the, in this. You can go to the liberal, to the conservatives, or to the one in the middle. Whoever it is, love is missing. But the law requires love. Because the law shows where you're connected to. 
But we haven't seen that because we have not understood the law. We have an ignorance of the law. The law is not showing us towards the effect. It just through the effect shows us to the cause. That's why we have no light. Because we have not understood that the law brings and shows us the cause. Because look to this here. What is Paul in his things describes? Is he trying to reform his actions? Does he say, I must stop having lust? Does he say, I go to fight against lust? Is he saying that in the, in, the, in, the, in the text? Not at all. Because he understands the role of the law. The law comes to show you the cause of lust. And lust is something given by God. It is just where you go with it. So he says, the law shows me the cause of it. And so, if I understand the cause of it, how much solutions do I have? What shall I do when I fall into sin? What shall I do when I am thinking I had a choice not to sin? What shall I do? If I think I have a choice, then I just simply must take the choice. Like a young preacher once said to the youth heel, spoke to Hittas at the Youth Congress. He said, Youth, just stop doing it. And I was saying, my friend, have you never read and you have never known the state that those youth people cannot do what they want? And here Paul says, what I hate that I do. And I say, and then they come up and some preacher says, if you just hate enough the evil, you won't do it again. What a terrible mistake. You can hate evil as much as you want. You still do it. I hate to be aggressive. I hate to get nervous. I hate to not control myself. And what do I do? Exactly what I hate, I do. And I will not stop doing it except through one thing. There's just one thing that must be changed. And what is it? We must change the source. The legal connection is there. That's the problem. And how can you solve that wrong connection we are all born with that doesn't give us the choice? The effects, the works of the law, just show us where comes the motivation. So through the works, we understand that something is wrong, but we don't, we don't correct the works. That would be stupidity. That would be fighting against reason. That would be fighting against all odds. You have no power. To do the right if the connection is wrong. And we read it last time. Jesus says it in Luke 6.45. A man brings out his deeds either of his treasure that is good in his heart or of the treasure that is evil in his heart. The effects just shows your connection. And in one connection, you are free to do what you want. And in the other connection, you are not free to do what you want. You do exactly that, what you hate, you do. That's slavery. When we do the will of God, when we are connected to God, we, we, we do the right because we want the right. We won't fight again. We won't speak evil again. We won't bring out an evil thing out of us if... The connection would be in God. But you see, we have not understood. The law is pointing us to the cause. Because the cause can be only uh, changed by one thing. And what does Paul say here? 
Let's read Romans 7 from the beginning of the chapter. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law? How nice would that be if today people would speak to people who know the law? Because, you know, if we all would know the law, we would have no discussions among us. We would know what we must do when we see that we do sin. We won't fall into guilt thoughts. We won't fall into despair. Like this week, I spoke with a young lady who has a mother who is for a long time a Christian. And just her mother told her that she saw in her, in her devotion in the morning and she found three Bible verses where she found that she has no choice anymore. She is lost forever and she must die. And she wants to kill herself. You would never come to the idea that you lost your chance. That God cannot forgive you if you would know that you're a slave of sin. Would you? If you would know that you have no choice to not commit sin. Except something happens. Except something which brings you out of that terrible situation where you cry out, Oh, wretched man who I am! That's the cry of a slave. That's not the cry of a guilty one. That's not the cry of one that is full of guilt and thinks God will punish him in his wrath. No, it's the call of a man who realizes the importance of the law. And it's a call of a man who knows that he cannot do what he wants but he want what he hates he does that's the call of a slave and so because he knows who in which situation he is paul knows exactly what he must do to be saved to come out of that wretchedness look to this but now ye not bread, know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. That's the, that's the title of the whole chapter. Because go through it and you will see the only solution for the legal connection, to come out of the illegal connection, is to come into the to, into the legal one is if you die. That's the, that's the only way. That's why he says, and the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. Verse 10. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. So did the law kill me? No. But the power of sin is the law. That's why he says, for I was alive without the law wants. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What did he do? He died. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. This is the explanation what I'm going to read now from verse 2. The only solution to remove the cause is you must die to the illegal connection. That what keeps you in bondage cannot be reformed. You cannot go back to God except that stopping element of blindness is removed. You die, you don't sin. You don't die, you try to, to do it by yourself, you sin. And you will sin all the time. That's why people don't believe in uh, holiness, in complete restoration. Because they think you have to do the works. Yes, the works are just the result. Effects cannot be taken off. They are there because they prove a cause. And we're fighting the, 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 
the effects. That's righteousness by works. That's external behavior. And sinful nature can make you to be quite good in external behavior. But whenever you are coming up, when your son is going against you in the court for unrighteousness, you, it doesn't matter how holy you were until now, you now will be unholy. If your daughter is rejecting to help you, even if she could, you will do works that are unholy. If your spouse is betraying, betraying you, or whatever happens, that where hits your, your, your connection, where you have no power anymore to do what you think is right, then it is proven that you're in the wrong connection. Then you will do it. That's why temptations are so important. They just show us the connection. That's why for, for Peter it was so important that, he, that God allowed to be sifted by the devil because it was showing him his wrong connection through his works. And we saw that last time. So let's read. What's the solution? For the woman, verse 2, which has no hu an husband is bound by the law to the, her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband is dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead and she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So it's the same thing. You marry once when there was no legal adultery. That is, you take another man during your marriage. That is, that you can do not necessary by officially marrying, but just having sex with another person during your marriage. That's taking another man. That is going away. And Paul includes here in this marriage also this intercourse. So you leave the one and go to another one. Then you are doing and breaking the law. But if your husband is dead, you can take as anyone you want. There is no connection. You're not bound to the law. Now, Let's make sure here that we understand whenever Paul speaks about the bondage of the law, he speaks when you break it. When you don't break the law, you're not in bondage. You're only in bondage when you break it. Because he says, while her husband lives, she be married not. So she breaks the law, that's why she's in bondage to the law. If she keeps the law, she's free from the law. Wherefore, my brethren, and now he comes to, with the picture, he wants to make a clear picture for us to understand how we solve the issue. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now people say, ah, you see, we are dead to the law. <laughs> and they see the law can be changed. The law is, is dead. No, you're dead to the law because the law does not condemn you anymore because you now fulfill it in Christ, but should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That is what comes out of us when we are in the right connection. For when we are in the flesh, that's sinful nature, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So it's about works. It's about the deeds. It's about the end of it. But now we are delivered from the law. That is, we are free to keep it. That being that wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of of the letter. You see here, Paul has a clear understanding what needs to be joined, and we will see that in chapter 8, when we see next time, that he says, chapter 8, verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, no, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, in the whole context, the law 
You're only bound to the law when you break it. When you are not breaking it, it's the law. You have no bondage to anyone. You're free. So let's look to this in the pictures. There is a fight. There is an inner battle of man. And this is chapter 7 describes that. So let's look to our Savior because Paul says there is a solution in him. He says here, yes. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law. That is, the law cannot condemn you and you can fulfill it by the body of Christ. That's, not the, that's, the, that's the being of Christ. That's his life. That he should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So, the heart of Christ is that what we need to understand. So Jesus, as a man, he came out of his father, the God, and out of his mother, Mary. And so since his spirit knew who he was, he was connected from inception to his father. But he had to also have the sinful nature, that blindness that comes from Mary. He had no choice to not take that over. By the law, he had no choice. And it was needed because how should I die toward this if I cannot die to it? We'll see this in the next when we look to chapter 8 where we see where is the choice that we have and how God made it possible that out of an impossibility we could become pure and free again. So, Jesus always crucified. He never used his selfish nature. It was always mortified, never active, never developed. And on the cross, it was taken off and he became a new creature after his resurrection. We spoke about this last time or in the last lectures. This is the heart of our Savior. He always did what he wanted. He was a free agent. Even though having sinful nature, it never touched him. He was tempted. When we look to all the temptations, in the one thing, in whom to trust. And in all temptations, as strong as they were, he trusted to his father. And so he was never in his doing otherwise than what he wanted and what the father wanted. They were one in spite of having that. But he had to have that because he had to come into this life of Adam to rescue it, to bind it again to God. And I could speak hours for this. But now we are interested in us. So what is the will and the heart of a man at his birth? We are all born in blindness and in pure connections to the devil. And this blindness will never allow us to go back to God. We are ignorant that we are created beings. Totally ignorant. In our heart, we don't know it. We might know it in our will where we are one. We say, oh yes, we are not God. But in your actions, you always prove that you're God. We would never do one sin if we would not think we are greater than we are. Never one sin. So think of it. So it is unknown and covered for us who we really are. We think we are God. And so we are in total slavery. We cannot do that what we want. When it comes to a to the real point. Now, for a certain thing under grace, God gives us that even in sinful nature, we do certain good things. We understand smoking is not good, so we don't smoke. We understand that that is not good, and we don't do it. We understand that we should pray, and we should have devotion, and we do it. Yes, we think it's good. And the devil has no issues as long as we don't understand that something in us 
is wrong. And it doesn't matter what we do if the connection is wrong. It just doesn't matter. But we look to orgs and say, oh, I didn't do this. The rich young ruler said, I keep the commandment. Did he? Oh, I, he kept it after the letter. Yes, I did not kill. I did not commit adultery. Oh, Lord, I'm ready for heaven. And Jesus proves him. Because when he put him to do the commandment, could he do it? He could not do it. But he could have said, Jesus, save me. I want to give all I have, but I cannot. But you see, when Jesus tells you a word, that's the power. In the moment you take that word, that word changes you and makes you to do it. Like the paralytic in the moment, his, Jesus said, raise up. And his man said, yes, I do. In the moment he had the power. In that moment, his heart was connected to God. Because he had overcoming his blindness. But Jesus grinned and said, be very careful, don't sin again. Or don't go again into that thing, because something worse will happen to you. So at the birth, we all are in slavery. And God wants us to make us that clear. There's the only one thing that can bring us out, and that is death. If we don't die to the source, that is to selfish nature, that binds us to the devil, there is never a choice for us to do right. That's why first death must come. That's why we are dead. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. That is, to that law that binds you to do evil. To break it. Because if you're dead to the law, you can connect to God. Yes, this connection, you see, it's little faith, little trust. And this one here diminishes a little bit. So that we see when we are born again, we are not ready yet for heaven. Yes, we have changed the main part we are now connected to Christ. And we are now connected to God through Christ. We, because that is dead. But we still are in the battle. Romans 7 from verse 14 is not a one-time battle of an inner man. It's the daily battle of the inner man. That's why Paul says, I die daily. And I must say, this is also my experience since my newborn on 7th June 2003, since God has brought that cross in my life and I'm connected again to God, I am in a battle in my inner life. And I was fooled, yes, even after I was born again, a lot of times by my sinful nature. I was betrayed by it. I want to do the good and I don't do it. And I still are in this battle in the inner man. But at least at that point where I'm connected to God, I do what I want. God gave me the power to not do the things, the addictions that I had before were all gone. Because those things that came out of me here, they were because I was connected to the devil. Now that I'm connected to God, those things don't come out here anymore. And that's not by force, it's not that I have to do a battle for that which I am connected with God. Where I'm connected with God, all I do is right. But where I'm not get connected to God, all I'm doing is wrong. So Paul describes in Romans 7 as well the state of the sinner before his new birth as well as the state of the sinner after his birth because he must realize because we speak here about things that we must realize i must know where do i lie to myself i must know where i'm deceived and those are plenty of things peter john and all they were all newborn people but they were so bound to the devil in certain places they had no choice to not do the right the wrong when jesus went to that place to that city and they didn't want to allow him to go through Jesus was respecting them. He said, okay, I respect you because Father respects everyone. I respect also everyone, even though the will is not right. And the, what did the disciples say? They say, oh Lord, let us call 
from heaven. Like Elijah, fire, destroy them, and then we can go through this place. And Jesus says, you don't know which spirit is in you. You have the spirit of the devil. But they were his disciples. Yes, they were connection at certain points. But in other points, they were still in the devil's, devil's part. And Peter, the, the one that has the greatest mouth, he was so in the devil that Jesus had to show it to him by his works. When Peter denied the Lord, he saw that he had no choice to not deny him as long as the cross was not there for that part to give him the choice. It's only death that gives us the choice. And so we must die daily. And so you see this arrow here grows and the other one grows dimmer until we come to the complete restored human heart where the cross has killed that sinful nature that we don't do anymore what we cannot, but we, all that we do is the will of God. And then this is forever inactive, mortified. That's what Paul describes in Romans 8, and we'll see later, when it says that the righteousness of God can be fulfilled in us. Oh, the righteousness of the law. Because the law can never be changed. We are free from the law. That is, we, com we, we do it. You see, these people, and there were a few. The Bible tells us that they did it. Enoch was so completely restored that God took him to heaven because he said, I, I cannot let this man. He is, he is free from sin. Why should he die? And he's so faithful, he for 300 years, so he's restored. He's complete. And there's the man, Elijah, who we know that he did not trust always the Father. He, he had that big victory. And then when came the temptation with, with um, Isabel, he just showed that there were parts in him that were still connected to the devil. And he had to remove them. He had to remove the connection because sin is not a choice. Sin is showing slavery, the choices that to die. And so Elijah died and Elijah died to self. And when he was ready, when his, when his sinful nature was totally mortified and he was connected to God, God said, why should I keep him on earth? I take him to heaven. Because his heart is clear. And of course, through Christ, he removed that sinful nature because when he translated him to heaven, he was translated. He would have no sinful nature in himself anymore because he mortified it. By which, wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Through Christ, we can mortify our sinful nature as Christ mortified his sinful nature. And what is the will and the heart of a believer at resurrection or translation? I don't know exactly, but I want to do as, lot, as what I know. I am a child, a son of God. We are now not even created being. We are, yes, we are created being, but we are the sons. We are the adopted sons and daughters of God. What happens with our trust? Our trust is forever established and confirmed. There will never be through all eternity any idea that I can live out of myself. And then, how is the will? The will is restored. In my members, I do exactly what I want because I am one with God. And if I am one with God, what will come out through my members? Exactly that oneness. And life will be there forever. That's the plan that God has in salvation of men. Let's conclude. To fight against the deeds of sin is salvation by works. Because you want to perform good works, to be accepted to God. That's why this lady says, I failed in my works toward God and God, law condemns me. I'm bound to the law and I will die because I have sinned too much. My works have been too much, too many. 
and now the devil has her, has he? He has at that point where she cannot trust God anymore. But if she would understand the truth, and she might call me these days, and I hope to, understand, to make her plain, that she's fighting the wrong battle. If you try to reform your works, do it. You will end up in hell. The only thing we must reform, and that's not reformable, is to destroy our sinful nature, which keeps us in bondage to the devil's will, so that we don't do what we want, but we do the spirit, the, 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 we have the spirit of the devil, like the disciples of Jesus, let us turn fire down and destroy these people because they don't allow us to go through. That's the spirit of the devil, where you don't do what you want. You just get someone uh, gets you nervous, you, you getting nervous. The only way to overcome is to see that you have no choice. In your heart, you're bound to the devil by your sinful nature, and you must get rid of that. And that's only getting rid if you die. That's why Paul says, if you're dead, if that sinful nature that binds you to the devil is dead, then you can choose to serve God. Then you connect to God, and then you do exactly what you want, and you are free. You are made, you're, you're restored to the image of God. That's righteousness by faith, because only where you trust one, there you live. And I want to trust God. And I want one day, by God's grace, not to be translated at resurrection, but without dying. I believe with all my heart that God is able, if I'm understanding, to not reform my deeds, but die to sinful nature, to see where the wrong connection is, to see where sin is, to s that makes me to do the right, the wrong thing, then I want to be one day where my heart is totally free, where my selfish nature is mortified. I have no connection with the devil, anyone. He, it's like Jesus, he says, there comes the ruler of this earth and he findeth nothing in me. And that's my goal. And I know it's going to be work only through one means. That's the death of Christ in my heart that removes that power that keeps me sinning. And I hope you want the same. I hope you don't want to fight symptoms. You fight the cause. It's a battle, yes, but it's a battle for the good where you really get forward because you die to self. Then you will do exactly what God wants us to do. And we will be free from the condemnation of the law and fulfill it completely because out of us will come pure love, pure righteousness, pure truth, Everything that we take from God, we will do. Amen.